and <clears throat> what that what that really entails when it started what it looked like how many people have actually done it because i mean it's a if you could read latin you'd be good mm. i mean seriously if you could read latin there's no telling what we would come up with mm. but I, I got this book called religion of the teutons and it's been a go-to reference for me for a long time have you ever read it ever looked at it no i haven't and I'm it may wanna, be on my list. <laughs> well, it's available as a PDF, and that's how I oh. stumbled across it somehow. Excellent. And um, I think it came out. In, hey, I'm doing my I'm doing my show, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, love you, bye. No, too, bye. Kids, <laughs> give me my phone. I know, right? I think it came out in. Um, 1903 or something um it's part of a, a book handbook of the history of religions and it uh 1909 library of princeton theological seminary october 14th 1909 so it's been around for a minute it's over 100 years old sure so, so but even with this this much of it there's an exceptional amount of information that I think we, we do ourselves a disservice because we don't know. Yeah. I'll get back to PDA. It just works real slow. Um, it has a scope and general plan. It's a big book too. I've tried to reprint it, but it's such a large file. Um, oh. I mean, it's okay. 534 pages. So it comes off this 20,000 kilobyte file. And I can't do anything with that. All right, here we go. But there is a, uh, the most important part of this book are probably the footnotes. Because it not only goes over the history of Teutonic mythology, which I'm going to cover a little bit of tonight, it also has the footnotes, the references for everything. And it is, I've looked up quite a few of them, and it's, it's, it goes way back there, way further back than we think they would. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's got, it's got some, it's an intelligent man wrote it. He said its first aim should be to show what manner the sources have been discovered and made accessible, which is pretty, pretty important, in what way the material gained from these sources has been utilized, which is something that I think we struggle with today. And secondly, it should indicate the results reached. Okay, what good is this shit? Distinguishing between such as may be regarded as definitely established facts and such as may be subject to subsequent modification, what can we use to grow? What can be modified? What may not be correct? Thirdly, to point out to what extent the study has been influenced by the general currents of civilization, which is most assuredly something we're dealing with today. How is all of this old stuff being influenced by the currents of our civilization today? You could look at deck 127 or 124, or whatever it is, that's an influence of current civilization. You can look at your far right, David Lane. That's another current of influence on 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 this material by our civilization, um, political ideas, left and right. Um, we have to pay attention to that, as revealed by the questions to which our attention will have been directed, and the points of view from which the material will have been treated. And that's such a crucial thing. This first book that they talk about. Well, I'll just get to it here. Uh, in one narrative, we will have to pass constantly from one country to another, and that's always been a big deal. We go from Germany to Scandinavian investigators of Teutonic antiquity. They have, as a rule, followed and are to some extent still following different paths, and yet here we are in America combining the two and calling it good. That's another current of influence of our civilization. Teutonic mythology bears less of an international character than most other sciences, Although scholars of different nationalities have mutually influenced one another. So we're all kind of working on this stuff, but I don't see any of us working on what's the goal with this shit. Because by and large, what it has become is a shield from, from societal scorn for us to live this way. I know this. So I've got, I, well, you really don't understand. You really don't know. I know you don't. My brain power alone allows me to be above the rest. We haven't identified 
what the study of this is going to do. What's it going to look like if I adopt all this shit into my life? What kind of man am I going to become? What am I going to look like? What kind of woman will I become? Um, we sometimes, by and large, fail to do that. There's the old standard of traditional or conservative or tribalist or some of these other things that we kind of have an idea on. But what about, what about true success as a father? Because every good Christian man, well, we, he's probably a quite a good father. Do they say that about us? Because that's what we've got to be asking ourselves. What does, the, what does all of this do point together when they influence one another? What's it look like when we figure it out? What do we look like when we figure it out? Are we covered in tattoos? I feel like I should be covered in tattoos. I just don't have the money for it. But I feel pretty good about most other things. The study of Teutonic mythology may be traced back to the 17th century, when publications already appeared in which either the popular beliefs or the antiquities of a particular region are treated. Now, in 1691, a Scottish clergyman, R. Kirk, wrote a treatise on elves, fauns, and fairies, um, which has recently been reprinted as a document of historical interest. Now, that's a real important thing. Do you know what was happening in 1691 in Scotland? Well, that was right in the middle of, our, of these witch trials. So the King of Scotland went to Denmark and there was a big storm and there was some, a witch in Denmark they were fixing to burn or whatever because she was working with some witches to stop the King of Squ uh, Scotland from picking up his princess and going back. And when he goes back, well, somebody started over there and one of, the, one of the ladies over there said, we were working with the ladies in Denmark and it created this phenomenon that began the witch burning trials in Scotland that ended the last execution was 1707. The last trial was like 1720, somewhere in there. So right in the middle of it, this clergyman decides some of this stuff might be important to keep, elves, fawns, and fairies. How much liberty would he have to deviate from societal norms during a time like that of persecution to put that into, into print. But he did it anyway, and he got away with it. And it is now a document of historical interest. The uh, footnote is R. Kirk, Secret Commonwealth, 1691, with comment by A. Lang was reprinted in 1893, Bibliotheque de Clarabas. Uh, while in the Netherlands, at the same time, uh, no, earlier than that, J. Picart, P-I-C-A-R-D-T, in 1660, issued a work on Teutonic, Teutonic Antiquities. Now, that is, that's also in a foreign language. I can't pronounce. Antiquities were the province and the land of the Nordic. Johan Picart, 1660. Well, they're burning witches at that time, too. <laughs> What inspired these men to take a look at it? And why don't we remember them? I think that's the biggest thing we gotta ask ourselves. Why don't we remember that? As early as 1648, however, Elias Shudius had essayed a complete Teutonic mythology, a rather bulky work in which the passages of the ancient writers descriptive of various peoples are treated with little historical discrimination. So this guy drove off into flights of fancy. To these two sources, popular beliefs and the classical writers, they were soon added the records discovered in the North, the Codex Regius and such, and the antiquities brought to light in various parts of Germany. The books and treatises dealing with this material as a whole or in part had by the middle of the 18th century reached the number of 1,000. So by the middle of the 18th century, there were a thousand books and articles on Teutonic mythology. That rivals anything that we have today. And far closer to what we would consider the source material, old wives' tales, uh, great grandma talking about this, that, or the other, um, than anything we might come across. But it failed in all of that work, it failed to create an image it did result in one thing that we, we will get to that you cannot miss. Special mention among these should be made of Trogillus Arnkiel, who first made use of the works of Scandinavian scholars. So now we're getting up into the land of the Vikings. And of J.G. Keisler, who drew upon Latin inscriptions and popular beliefs. So now we're getting into, it, hell, it's probably buried in the Library of the Vatican. If you can read Latin, there are a number of sources that are 
astoundingly old. Uh, Trogillus wrote something in Latin, 1703, J.G. Keisler in 1720. Uh, I would, if you haven't got this, it, like I say, the religion of the Teutons is a PDF. It's available, it's a download, you can pick it up anywhere. It's way out of date. The file is way too large to reprint or I would have already done it. <clears throat> but be that as it may, nearly all of the writers of this period regarded the heathen gods from a euphemistic euf point of view as departed heroes, okay? Well, they're not going to give them too much credit because they're burning witches at this time. And if they were to start talking about, well, these gods, oh, you must be talking with the devil. To be burned at the stake was a special event where you would be garroted with a knot right here at your throat where you would be choked to death and then burnt. It was more humane that way. And these were humane Christians of the time. These witches had to go. But there was something telling these people at this time that, Maybe there's something else. <clears throat> no one of them was able to dis establish his work on a sound historical basis, though, by distinguishing between Teutons and Celts. So it's all one big melting pot still at this time. The Scandinavian countries are destined to give the first impetus to the fruitful study of Teutonic antiquity. It would be erroneous. They'd be fucking wrong. However, to suppose that in these regions, the classical period of medieval literature passed imperceptibly into the, study of his, into the period of historic study. Even in Iceland, the center of Old Norse literary development, the historic past and the indigenous literature were in the 15th and during the larger part of the 16th century, well nigh forgotten. The Renaissance does not begin until the end of the 16th century with the people I just mentioned, with the historical and literary labors of Angrimer Jonsson and Bjorn Jonsson Asgardsa. Much indeed had even been accomplished elsewhere. The Paris edition of Saxo dates from the year 1514. In the middle of the same century, the last Archbishop of Uppsala, Oleus Magnus, had made the first attempt at writing a Norse mythology based on Saxo on the Latin writers and on the conditions of his own time. Uh, this work appeared in 1555, was entitled Historia de Gentium Septenationalism Turis. Fuck, I can't pronounce that. Just anyway, you get the book, you can find it. <laughs> Be that as it may, it's there. He also investigated the monuments and drawn up a runic alphabet. This, this is in 1555, 15, so in the middle of that. Not until the 17th century, however, did the range of these studies begin to widen. In Denmark, Old Worm, Stephenius, and P. Resinius occupied themselves with monuments and runes, with the editing of Saxo and the collecting of manuscripts. So an effort's being made here by people who think this information might have some value, though they still have not cultivated an image of what the man or woman who follows this might look like in their society. Because at that time, it's going to be wildly different and quite possibly lethal to deviate from societal norms established by the church. But it's still being done. That is, that's important to remember. That tells me that something much larger is at work here. This was made possible after Brynjolf Svensson, the Bishop of Skalhalt in Iceland, had in 1640 discovered the most important manuscript of the Prosetta already known at that time, and had in 1643 first brought to light the Poetic Edda. And there it is right there. There's the most important manuscript, our Prosetta, which is why I don't much deviate from it. Despite the fact that the Great Fire in Copenhagen in 1720, 1728 destroyed many manuscripts, and that during the second half of the 17th century, many more were lost, there yet remained an extensive literature, including sagas preserved in four great collections. These four collections are one, the manuscripts collected by Bjornhoff himself and sent in 1662 to Arnie Magnusson, or no, sent to the King of Denmark, the Codes Regi, the collection of Arnie Magnusson made between 1690 and 1728, the Codices A&M, Both of these collections are to be found in Copenhagen. Three, the manuscripts collected by Stephenius, now at Uppsala, Codes is U, 
And four, the codices Holmesis, codices H, discovered in Iceland during the latter half of the 17th century and at present in Stockholm. So there's a big collection of literature here. And yet even at this time, they're calling the Prosetta, that's the top dog, man. That's where it's all the rest of it's coming from. When this literature was first brought to light, and indeed for a long time afterward, the most fantastic ideas prevailed concerning its origin and antiquity. And I will say that this, that word fantastic in this old book is spelled with PH. <laughs> what had been found was thought to be only a small fragment of an Eddic archetype attributed to the Aesir themselves or to the Princess Edda. And that's an interesting title that I've only ever seen in this book, but the Princess Edda, it must be Saga, um, shortly after the time of Odin. This archetype, it thought, contained the patriarchal beliefs of the ancient Atlantis dwellers. Well, they got attributed to somebody some 300 years before the Trojan War. The oldest runes were believed to date from 2000 BC. That's quite a stretch, or a ways back, I should say. I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if they were that old. Following the wake of Danish scholars and under the influence of conceptions peculiar to the 18th century, conceptions peculiar to the 18th century mean the influence of the church, the Victorian age. Mallet, a Swiss, wrote a book, the purpose of which was to delineate the history of civilization. The North was extolled as the cradle of liberty, which indeed it is. The foundational documents of the United States of America are based upon the ideas that Thomas Jefferson picked up while he attended Cambridge concerning the Angles and the Saxons and those great Anglo-Saxon chieftains that conquered much of, uh, that settled um, your better part of Wessex and founded the line that is currently the, the uh, royal family of England, Great Britain today. Um, slavery, the first of instances of the emancipation of slaves occurred in Europe. The rights of women were first embraced by these tribes of Northern Europe. It truly is a history of a cradle of liberty. The idea of the Republic coming from Greece and all of these, yes, there was an influence there. There was certain aspects of it. But the cradle of liberty and the personal responsibility is most thoroughly pronounced with regards to the ideas of Big Balder who gave the most favorable judgments, in whose room, the least baleful rooms in his home, whose, in whose home the least baleful rooms existed. And his son, it, Odin and Frigga's grandson, Forseti, why he is the man who offered the soundest judgments. He is the God that, all, that settled all disputes. He is the God from which the Gothis, who met out punishment, uh, derived their authority. The idea that we might create liberty, this cradle of liberty, why, what might a man accomplish if he were not afraid of, well, you don't do that. Because much of our governmental ideas today are, are, are a mirror of the probationary attitude that is the hallmark of Christian or monotheistic belief systems. You are on a probationary period. If you screw it up, you will spend the, just this small part. Well, there's all of eternity out here. If you step out of line here, if you look at that boob, you're going to burn. Um, we had this cradle of liberty in the North, and our gods were very much a part of that. Justice. You see it in some other pagan ideas. We see it in Greek and Rome and some of the other uh, pagan civilizations. But the Northern Europeans were ahead of the time in this way. Malay included in this treatise a translation of several selections from the Eddas. So now we're translating the Eddas. The book was translated into English in 1770 by Bishop Percy, who added an important preface in which a sharp distinction was for the first time drawn between Teutonic and Celtic legends and antiquities. Now we're beginning to understand there's more than one group here that's embracing these ideas, these thoughts, these belief systems. Literature was turned to these finds to good account. In Germany, Herder, with his breadth of view, did not fail to recognize the value of Old Norse literature. Neither did J.R. Tolkien. Standing under the influence of the currents of thought prevailing in the 18th century. So there's that line again, currents of thought prevailing in the 18th century. Make no mistake, we have currents of thought prevailing in our 21st century as well. He paved the way for the romanticism of the 19th. 
now we're going to see beautiful Valkyrie, whereas before they may not have been such a welcome sight. His broad and profound intellect combined cosmopolitan interests with an appreciation for the characteristically national. A love for the natural with a feeling for historical development. He took hold of the new material and opened up new points of view. Sounds like my kind of guy. From near and far, he gathered folk songs. Though among these naive Stinman der Volker, as he called them, there is many a song which we no longer regard in this light. Thus, he believed Volusa to be a product of primitive times. Although he recognized that criticism had not yet passed as a final judgment on the poem, the less known F.D. Greater also helped to spread knowledge of a Norse mythology and of folk song. In Denmark, the spirit of patriotism served to heighten the interest of the newly discovered poetry. So now it's beginning to give these people an identity as a culture, as a unit, as a country. And it will continue to do so. And this leads to the justification of the expansions of all of these empires. Olenschlager proceeded on the supposition that the Eddic poems were part of a single production sought through his cycle of poems, the Nordisch Guder in 1819, to infuse new life into the old myths. What the elder Grootvug achieved along this line also belongs to the domain of literature rather than that of science. NFS Grundtvig, the enemy of rationalism, the champion of personal faith, and of the living word as against petrified formalism in church and dogma, also showed great zeal in advocating the development of national character and put the stamp of his individuality on the intellectual life of his people. Now we're beginning to see that this understanding of faith, as I said in when I talk about uh, Otter and his journey. He develops, he cultivates his faith. He calls upon the goddess. And she, after he develops his faith to the point where he might connect with the divine, she reminds him of who he is, where he comes from, what he's made of. How dare he doubt his ability to become something greater, which is important to consider. All right. Thank you for blowing my ears out. <laughs> But he puts in this, he begins to work the ideas of faith into it. And that's kind of the first time that that's really happened. And it's kind of, and he's outside of that danger zone. He's a hundred years past the witch trials, a hundred years after the threat of persecution for a deviation from faith. Now all of a sudden, personal faith once again begins to rear its head. And as I have read before that the last people to accept the shackle and the yoke of Christianity were the first to shed it as soon as they got the chance. And this is our, this is our evidence of such a uh, effort. And it comes from our lore. Imagine that, a powerful document which has every bit the impressive stature and character of the greatest facilities, structures of Rome or Egypt, and yet it resolves around the ability of our minds to become what they're supposed to become, of our hearts to beat strong with people of our own type. What an amazing thought that our literature might be every bit as magnificent a monument as those we stand in awe of and wonder at. If only we had but the eyes to see. What an amazing idea. His enthusiasm for the Norse heroic age, his acumen in the treatment of myths was profound figurative language he sought to interpret. His graceful renderings of these ancient legends in beautiful poems. What a fine way to treat this history, this ancestral faith. Ancient legends and beautiful poems with graceful renderings, should we not also consider that today? All of this may have borne little or no fruit to the cause of science, but it has unquestionably imbued the heroic age with new life in the popular mind. Now we're beginning to cultivate an image of what it might mean for people that want to follow this path and way of life. I see wonderful things. I see beauty. I see grace. I see song. I see wonderful things in these ancient legends. Will they allow me to cultivate those abilities? Might I become something more, someone worth admiring? Might I become larger than life in the eyes of my children? What greater thing could there be? Meanwhile, the opinion that the Eddie contained a most ancient, original, and splendid mythology was not held without opposition. It's always going to be a turd. Always going to be a turd in the punch bowl when you start to shake things up. 
Finn Jonsson, who a century after Brienhoff held the Episcopal sect of Skalhalt, recognized in the Edda a mixture of Christian ideas and scandalous fabrications. Now, you damn right he's going to. We're still not clear of the all-powerful influence of Protestant theologies, the Lutheran Reformation, the Catholic Church, uh, Islam, Judaism, all of those monotheistic ideas. So how would you nip that kind of stuff in the bud? Because the people that are beginning to feel that way, well, they're going to continue to shed that yoke. You're not, those preachers, they're not going to be as important as they used to be. That is what's happening today. And here comes somebody along and says, no, 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 wait a minute. This is too heavily Christianized. And when I see that amongst people of today, I'm like, you're, t you're retarded. We're, you know, if you can't separate the wheat from the chaff at this point, when you sit around and say, well, it's too heavily Christianized. A Christian idea, let's be very clear on what that means. The monotheistic ideas of the probationary period of a man's life on this world as determined by an ultimate authority is in no way similar to what we're looking at with regards to our lore, our poetic and our prosetta. That tells us you have what it takes to go and become something great of your own accord. We have blessed you again and again and again. We expect nothing in return. Join us at the table. This is not a Christian idea of an ultimatum or authoritative king that sits with his back to the wall and makes people bow so they don't stab him in the face. Those are the actions of a tyrant. We're looking at an idea, but Finn Jonsson, he's, go he's not going to be wrong. He's not going to be wrong in his chosen idea. But in a brief survey of the production, he discussed the main features of the religion in a somewhat dry and prosaic fashion. Uh, the Historia Ecclesiastian of the Island, the Ecclesiastical History of the Island. So he's enhancing or reaffirming the monotheistic faith, reinforcing the pillars which keep these ideas of monotheism belief solidly entrenched within that island and much with indeed with much of Europe. It's his job. That is a cultural wind or cultural influence of the time. In a a deeper impression was made by the direction in which Teutonic studies, Teutonic mythology took back in Germany. So in case you, you know, one of the reasons I can talk about this nonsense is me and Brandy have been going over this and we missed a couple of weeks for the holidays, but we've been going over this, studying this because this book really is full of amazing information. As early as 1720, Keisler suspected the existence of Christian influences in North mythology. Oh, no, let's discredit it. Towards the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, this opinion steadily gained ground through the writings of von Schlosser, F.R. Edelung, and F.R. Ruse. The work of these three authors is frequently placed in one category, but in reality, only of that of Ruse possesses scientific value. So the author of this, Religion of the Teutons, is giving legitimate recourse. He's going to point out and say some things. He distinguished in North mythology three factors, popular conceptions from Teutonic age, origin, Christian ideas, and fragments of Greek and Roman mythology. The Edda, he contended, could not be regarded as the common heritage of the Teutons, nor even all of Scandinavians. It was a poetic production that had originated in Iceland under Anglo-Saxon influences. The culture of the North was of Christian origin. The kinship of these ideas with recent theories and results is self-evident. Now, here's why he's wrong. Because one, come much, er, one come a long, long, long time before the other. See, the oral tradition of these poetic and prose eddas predates the, the solidification of Christianity in 372 or at the Council of Nicaea, wherever it happened under Constantinople or Constantine uh, by a long time. Why? How, how are you going to compete with that? You simply put it in print, keep saying it, and eventually people are going to read it. It's like the low information voters with the drive-by media, as Rush Limbaugh always says. They're going to say, oh my gosh, he's going to destroy cultural sites. No, he's not going to destroy cultural sites. He's going to destroy sites of influence in a military manner. That's how that works. But at first glance, people kind of lose their heads on that. So if you're going to church every day, you're trudging along in the kind of the poverty, the mud, the boot, making a nickel a day, working in the cold and the heat, and you're going to church, 
praying for a miracle, hoping for it to change, and then all of a sudden something comes along and reminds you, uh, you made for something better than this. Why, absolutely it's going to be poo-pooed. <laughs> a stupid ass word, poo-pooed. The chief center of these studies remained for the time being. Copenhagen, where a collection of manuscripts and monuments were deposited, and where also these studies received strong encouragement because they were regarded as subserving national interests. So now when you have separation of church and state and you find something that enforces or empowers the government, now all of a sudden they're at odds with each other. What an interesting dynamic that these documents which support and encourage the cradle of liberty would create a division between a government that wants free people to prosper and a church that wants people to serve and pay tithe. Everybody got to pay their taxes, you can't get out of it where they also, uh, because they were from 1777 to 1783, a beautiful edition of Snorri's Heimskringla in three volumes was published at the expense of the Danish crown prince. Well, imagine that. <laughs> he wants his people to believe in their king. In 1806, the erection of a museum of Norse antiquities was begun. In 1809, the publication of the Danish Krankweiser was commenced, while a few years later, in 1815, the Icelander Thorak Island furnished the Aditio Precepts of Beowulf. Hmm. Rasmus Nelrup, 1759 to 1829, carried on extensive investigations in old Danish popular literature, archaeology, and mythology. R.K. Rask, 1787 to 1832, was one of the founders of modern linguistic science sought the origin of Old Norse in Old Thracian. So people, at this time, this is really and truly the age of exploration, the second age of exploration after the Golden Age of the Bronze Age, had, had the Bronze Age had collapsed. This is the new age of exploration where old trade routes and great ideas and people are going on long voyages to do risky things and they may not come back. But if you give them an idea about the nation, their king, their country, and what they might serve for freedom and the believement, they will go out and slay an entire country and plant that flag. And that's exactly what's going on here. While Rash did not extend his comparisons to the Asiatic languages, the Icelander Finn Magnuson did not hesitate to find parallels in Oriental and Egyptian mythology, which he regarded as evidences of a common primitive origin. Graham Hancock in today's world is doing the same thing. And he's pointing all the evidence back to the United States before a magnificent disaster at the Younger Dryas period, at the end of the last ice age when either a small, our sun did a small nova and burnt everything off or a comet hit. And when I say a comet hit, it's not just a once and done kind of thing. It's probably the foundation for Hagalaz, the radical destruction of the hailstone. For 20 years, every six months, fragments of the comet that smashed into the North American, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, the Ice Sheet in Greenland, and several other locations, every six months for 20 years, these hailstorms would come along and it would look like Australia does right now and burn shit to the ground. This was a hard, hard time to be alive. People that survived that left North America and carried with them their traditions. If they were already at sea, they went somewhere else. Now all of a sudden the idea of the legend of the Vassier traveling along, imparting the secrets of civilization to other cultures, why that's not such a far-fetched idea, is it? Where might that have originated? They're, un they're burning the Amazon down so they can farm it. And as they burn it down, they're finding hinges that are the exact same size, dimension, and characteristics of the hinges in England. They have found skeletons and they studied the DNA of the skeletons and they possess the same exact DNA markers as the people of the Aborigines of Australia. A world trade route at that long ago. Can you imagine that? And yet it's entirely a possibility. I digress. I get excited about it because I like it. I wrote a book on it called Life and the Love of Life. You might have heard. <laughs> the horizon gradually widened. Oh, I missed a part. The fact that no reliance can be placed uh, both in editions of texts and in works of mythology, he made use of an enormous mass of material, much of which is still of value despite the fact that no reliance can be placed on his astronomical interpretations, on the accuracy of his oriental parallels or on his theory of the Trojan origin of the Northern peoples. 
Thus, the horizon gradually widened, notwithstanding the fantastic and arbitrary combinations that were still being made. Today, there are many scientists who will tell you without a shadow of a doubt. In the end, even the Aryan idea is one of those fantastic and arbitrary combinations, and they have the evidence to prove it. Skule Thorlacius, in a study on Thor and his hammer, went so far as to make an isolated attempt to distinguish between the earlier and the latter elements of the mythology. Well, of course it's going to develop and grow. Who is to say on an uninterrupted timeline, in the beginning, Tyr was the one-handed god that held Gungnir. Tyr was, Tyr was the, the chief sky god of your Central Asian steppe people, your Indo-Iranian Aryan peoples. Um, he was their chief god. As time progressed and Christianity began to be the powerful negative influence, Odin ascended to the throne after his personal sacrifice. Who is to say on an uninterrupted timeline 2,000 years later, why today don't we all wear Thor's hammer? Is it not Thor sitting on that throne? The warder of men and all of us looking for some kind of push? What would that look like? It might have, hell, it might have been Frey. We might be living in a time of, of pleasure and abundance, but we're not. We're, cold, we're trying to cultivate lives, as Alan Watts says, a bunch of, amidst a mythology of technology that is a soul-crushing endeavor. <laughs> be that as it may, no one of these men, however, produced work of more lasting value than P.E. Mueller, who took up the gauntlet in defense of the genuineness of the AC religion in a manner that carried conviction to the Brothers Grimm and to many of their successors. He was the first to render a rich and well-arranged collection of, of heroic and historical sagas from medieval Norwegian Icelandic literature accessible and his edition of Saxo with Prolegomena, P-R-O-L-E-G-O-M-E-N-A, and Note Uberioris, completed after his death by J.M. Velsho, possessing lasting value. I have yet to see any of the so-called academics of today who talk like they know something mention either one of those works, or indeed any of the works that we've talked about today. And yet I'm being told, I'm looking at this, written at the turn of the last century saying, Look, man, we got a book of, a, we got a library of over a thousand books by the 17th century of, we got this. It's like we're reinventing the wheel all over again and getting much of it wrong and using almost all of it as a crutch. Still haven't figured out after all this time that unless we cultivate a faith and an image of what this really was, we also will be a footnote in the history, the annals of history. I, for one, don't intend to let that happen, which is why I write the way I write. <coughs> Before the advent of the Grimm's, Germany was far behind the Dane and Icelanders in the study of mythology. With the national revival, however, that followed the French domination. The famous minister of education, von Stein, gave the first impulse towards the publication of that gigantic collection of historical sources known as the Monumenta Germanae Historica which under the editorship of G.H. Pertz began to appear in 1826. But indispensable of these sources subsequently proved to be for the study of Teutonic heathenism, their publication at first exerted little or no influence. Hmm, imagine that. What's that look like if I read that? Is it worth my time? It's difficult to form just a just estimate of the value of the mythological work done in Germany during the first decades of our century under the influence of Roman Romantic movement. When you have a great idea that stirs the imagination as well as moves the heart, great things can be done, and also evil things can be done. There can be no question of the good service which the movement rendered to the cause of science and of culture. Through the two Schlegels, Schlegels August Wilhelm and Frederick, and through Tick, the language and gnomic wisdom of the ancient Hindus, as well as the works of Calderon and Shakespeare, and such subjects as the Middle Ages and popular poetry were first brought within the general horizon. The Romanticists were also strongly attracted towards the study of the national past and of Teutonic paganism, through this interest, though this interest did not proceed from the above-mentioned leaders of the movement. Heidelberg became the center for the study of mythology with Gores, von Arman, Brentano, and Kruser as the chief representatives. Hmm. 
Among these most gifted, perhaps, was Joseph Gores, 1776 to 1848, who devoted himself to editing German chapbooks. It was he who perceived the relationship between the Norse and German legends of the heroic saga and recognized the age of migrations as the period which gave rise to the legends among Goths, Franks, and Burgundians. He was in error, however, in assuming that the heroic legends were fragments of a single colossal poem. Gorius subsequently turned aside from the study of Teutonic antiquity to seek after the manner of his spiritual kinsman, Cruiser, in the myth of Asia, the profound symbolical utterances of supreme wisdom. So on the uninterrupted timeline, we have some idea of what it might look like if we pay attention to India or Japan or Southeast Asia, Shinto, Buddhism, Hindu. That's an uninterrupted timeline of what a pagan culture might look like. I don't know if y'all have seen Japan or parts of China. China's communist now, but parts of India are really nice and parts of it really suck. But there's some interesting stuff that's cultivated there by people that believed they could. The caste system in India is obviously a problem, but that's a whole nother story. Perhaps I'll delve into that. Matter of fact, I'm going to. Cruiser himself did not make a study of Teutonic antiquity, but in his, in his spirit, F.J. Moon, 1796 to 1871, added to Cruiser's great work two volumes of Slavs, Celts, and Teutons. In addition to this, Moan brought together what it was for that time a good collection of material for the study of the heroic saga. So now we're getting the foundations of Joseph Campbell's work. So when you, well, I'll finish this paragraph and then I'm probably gonna wrap it up. Nor are his investigations in this field without value, although this value is somewhat lessened by his tendency to seek and miss the ideas of speculative philosophy. There is less to be said in favor of the work of L. Aiken von Armen and Clemens Brantano, who from 1806 to 1808 published a collection of folk songs under the title Der Snobben Wunderhorn, Wunderhorn. <laughs> Though the book won great favor, the slovenly manner in which it was edited, probably they'll say that about mine too, and the large amount of worthless material it comprised did not escape the keen eye of that ruthless critic in matters of mythological J.H. Vos. Now, yeah, J.H. Vos probably had a turkey neck. And if, he, if there was a mom's basement, you probably lived in it. But the scientific productions of Germany during this period are conspicuous both for their virtues and their shortcomings. Though a lively interest was taken in the study of mythology, there was no lack of grand conceptions. The methods of work were uncritical and marked by wildly fantastic combinations. So they got carried away. Now their image is a little too grand. The Ubermensch is about to be born, folks. The opinion prevailed widely that in the province of mythology, ideas came to the gifted student through a sort of poetic inspiration. Good. That's where it's supposed to come from. You're sitting around parroting somebody else's ideas, you're not going to grow. You're going to get to where that person was, and that's where you're going to stay. As a consequence, it is not surprising that the works written in this period do not possess permanent value. Damn. Thus, many of the Teutonic divinities, which G. Clem enumerates, never existed, and it frequently involved considerable effort to remove such names as Crodo, Yeka, Hamon, Jodut, etc., from the list of Teutonic deities. So this guy got carried away just started making something up. Sounds like, well, it's almost like, it sounds kind of a lot like Wicca, doesn't it? Let's just make one. I'll pick one from over here. I'm going to pick one from over here. Let's take a goddess from down there. And I like this god over here. Let's put them all together and celebrate the Dumast. <laughs> C.K. Barth, in a volume which reached a second edition, identified Hertha with Demeter, Isis, Io, Thetis, and a number of other goddesses. Here and there, however, fruitful work was accomplished. This is mine. And occasionally ideas were brought forward that gave promise for the future. That's also mine. Thus, H. Leo called attention to the limits to which the worship of Odin was confined geographically. In Berlin, F. H. von der Hagen published studies and editions of the Nibelungen Lay and the Norse sagas, which, though marked by less grandeur of conception, showed sounder scholarship than the more brilliant effusions of the Eidelberg circle. So we just now got to the brothers Grimm and Wilhelm, and we're nowhere near some of the people that we celebrate as ancient scholars. There's a world of stuff we don't know. And 
like I say, this book has been a go-to source for my kind of academic research. And a lot of people say I, they don't pay attention to what I've studied or read, but I did go through a two-year mentorship with Matt Flavelle to get my Gothi credentials for the AFA. And there was a damn lot of reading in that. I stumbled across this book in the study of that course, and it's been a, it's been a fantastic thing. So I highly encourage you, if you want to understand some of the academic ideas these people are talking about, because you we all see them. They get in these long-winded discussions about high-minded ideals, and they're parroting somebody they think from the last century might have been reasonably intelligent, not knowing that they're all, those guys are also parroting stuff that has been going on since the 15th century. And nowhere has the parroting of these academic ideas cultivated the idea or the image of what we might become if we were to truly embrace this as a spirituality and a faith. What does that look like? I see people that embrace that. I see people that stand up, accept challenges. They become stronger. They become sturdier in their relationships. They become worthwhile members of society. I don't see them front loading their message with the demand that we understand that, well, you might really be a victim. You just don't know it. You know, this group over here rules or this group, you know, we're going to be kept down the plight of the white man. There's a romantic idea that we ought to consider embracing as if it might be a legitimate course for us to become something more, no matter what's happening in the world. If we continue to be distracted by all these other things, we'll never be the confident individuals we're capable of to handle the results of all of the nonsense we see going on around us. Because whether we like it or not, we live in a world that could give two shits whether or not we develop, cultivate the gifts that we were born with or the capabilities that we have. They will all dine at your table once you do, but until you do, you better know your place. Let's use this also to cultivate those gifts. Let's stand up and become men worth knowing, men worth heaping honor upon, or maybe just as simply being the kind of man that's worth a woman calling him husband or a little kid calling him daddy. Man, you start with something simple like that, there ain't nothing gonna stop you folks. Any man that walks out his front door with the full confidence that my wife loves me my children are in a good place in this world, can do anything that the day brings to his feet. Anything. And the limits to your success in that state of mind are simply the limits of your thought process. That's the way I feel about it. That's the way I believe. And I appreciate every one of you coming on tonight. And uh, I knew it was going to be kind of dry. I tried to liven it up a little bit, making fun of myself, because that's just what I do. <laughs> But this is a real, true, important work with regards to where we might come from. And there's some real serious lessons we can learn from this. Um, if anybody has any question, um, feel free to jump on and, and hit me with it. If I got a book here, I could probably answer that sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Well, if not, I'm going to turn the recording off and then... Uh, put this on YouTube so the rest of the world might become as enlightened as we are. That's fine for you. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Hey, thanks, Jay. I appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, that I look was forward a, to it. Yeah. I might finish this up next week, just this first chapter. The page, It's got 500 or some odd pages to the 534 pages. And it's, it's a really, it's a really good book. His treatment of some of the lore is, is, is really neat. And it's very old. So it's always a, an interesting point of view to take into consideration when you read through the book. Um, it's 534 pages, but I, I've spent time just going through trying to find these books. You know, Google library has saved a bunch of this stuff. Um, they're, so they're in German, they're in uh, Danish or whatever, and, and they're in Latin, but they're, they're an essential. They really are foundational to what we're trying to do here. And the fact that it's so far back from what everyone else is calling an important piece of work, um, you learn the foundations of where they got that work that these guys are basing their work on. 
you know, people like Simic and HR List Davison and all these others, they're not even mentioned in here. And yet, um, they're all, it's all there. But like I said, the ed is where it really, really, really starts. And people make, people kind of scoff when I say there's no situation in life you can bring up that I can't help you get through with an understanding of the lore, specifically the poetic and the prosetta. But man, I promise you, if you do this, keep doing it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you'll see that it's there. You'll see that it's there. And that also, I'll tell you what, what's unintentionally happening is it's allowing us to create an oral tradition that is essential for the solid mentorship of this moving forward. Because we, I find myself telling my children about it. It's becoming this oral tradition that's coming out in our conversations just to talk. And it's just, uh, it'll probably continue on that way. Hopefully it'll go beyond, well, my granddaddy always said, but no, you need to say that. You know what I mean? That's what yeah. I hope. Anyway. All right, guys, I appreciate everyone coming on. Every, I'm going to call you in just a second, bub. Everybody Sounds have good. All right, man. All y'all have a good night. Thank you very much. Go out there tomorrow on Monday, grab it by the nose, and whip its ass. Have a good day. <laughs>